Hey guys, we're back with The Nine Realms Season 7. Sorry this took so long, but I think a majority of you guys also understand that this show is my ultimate kryptonite. Every time I watch a new season, I just get weaker. And it does not help that new seasons are coming out faster than any television show I've ever seen in my life. The show will have ended god knows how long ago by the time this video goes live, so cut me some slack here. As for cosplay, I've attempted Eugene this time around. The king himself, aka the only other bearable character in this show besides Alex. And I think it's very fitting because, phew, did this season need all the help it could get. I have seen from a multitude of people online that the general consensus surrounding season 7 is that it is the worst season so far. But quite frankly, that's how I've felt about pretty much every season in this show and I don't see it getting any better. So because of the lengthy wait, I won't make you guys sit through a super long intro this time around. I would rather just jump into the insanity. As a blanket disclaimer, I put in all of my Nine Realms reviews Please do not harass or go after anyone who worked on the show or people who support the show publicly. They have every right to love the show as I have to hate it. But before we get started, I wanted to give a very special shout out to today's sponsor, Aura. Everyone deserves to be protected from harmful material while browsing the internet. Just think of all the dangers that lurk online. Identity thieves, hackers, Tom and June shippers. But luckily, Aura offers a combination of identity protection, insurance, credit, and social security monitoring all from the convenience of a singular app. They also have a built-in VPN, antivirus software, and password protection to cover all of your family's devices. You never know when you're gonna need to be protected. I mean, for all I know, a relentless assassin could be on their way to take me out just because I like to talk smack about their show. The same goes for the internet, if not twofold. And Aura's identity protection can give you the peace of mind that you need to browse the internet safely. And if Aura did detects any data breaches or suspicious activity with your information, you'll be notified right away. Meaning with Aura's services, you can have the peace of mind that your data is protected. Can I do my ad read, please? And using my custom link in the description, Aura is offering a full two-week free trial of their services. That's aura.com slash Audrey. If you're not happy with the services, you can cancel the free trial at any time with absolutely no charge to you. Again, that's aura.com slash Audrey. And thank you to Aura for sponsoring today's video. So without further ado, Let's go on a journey, hooligans, of needless conflict and Tom and June becoming an official couple. What? This might be the shortest Stuff I Liked section ever included in these reviews. Because I could not pull a single positive thing about this season that I haven't pretty much already said in every other review so far. Alex and Eugene. They're great. Alex is sassy, Eugene is a king, and really speaks for the entire audience way more than he normally does this season. But even their episodes, which yes, both of them have episodes dedicated to them this season, are on the lower end of the scale in terms of quality we normally see from them. Which is especially disappointing considering that this is Alex's first episode in two seasons, and the fact that Eugene's episode in season six might be the best in the entire show so far. But outside of those, too. I guess the new glass caster's abilities were cool. It is a hideous model and very reminiscent of the Sandbuster from Race to the Edge, but the few differences between the two were interesting enough to hold my attention. And I can't really think of much else. Those are legitimately the only things that come to mind, even having seen the season as many times as I have at this point. While I still think the overwhelming opinion that season 7 is far worse than all the others is a bit unprecedented considering the show has always been this bad. It is, admittedly, more concentrated this season. Oh yeah, and sorry to inform you, but my initial reactions for this season were corrupted, so there won't be any of my raw first impressions this time around. But just assume that every episode I was just staring at the screen with a tired, angry face while questioning my life choices. So yeah, let's get into the seven new episodes. Yay! Seven again! <laughs> you <laughs> 
Episode 1 is titled Hobbs and Saw, and I find it incredible that a spin-off universal train wreck deriving from a successful franchise named one of their episodes after another spin-off universal train wreck deriving from a successful franchise. It focuses on two very different plots that have pretty much nothing to do with each other, but they crammed both of them into one episode anyways. Technically, this is a D'Angelo-centric episode, and by virtue, Phil-centric as well, because God forbid we give D'Angelo an episode dedicated to exploring his character without that involving some conflict with his father. And the other plot is Tom and the rest of the group attempting a mission to get the Dragon Book back from Buzzsaw, who, if you remember from last season, received it in a trade for an antidote to cure thunder that didn't actually end up being an antidote, blah blah blah. Watch my season 6 review. As a matter of fact, watch all of them. I cannot figure out how certain people jump into later seasons and are able to understand anything that's going on, but I absolutely applaud your patience. Although I do feel the need to refresh your memory with how season 6 ended, being this massive cliffhanger where Buzzsaw is burning down Rake Town and now the adults know that he's a threat and it's up to everyone to keep safe from him, I guess. And I spent a great deal of the end of my last review trying to predict what would happen at the beginning of season 7 following this, one of my predictions being all of the kids running around with machine guns jumping in trenches and the town turning into a complete war zone like Call of Duty and I was kind of right. Season 7 starts out with absolutely no tension, and everything we saw burning down at the end of Season 6 is perfectly fine, of course. Why would we actually commit to any of the destruction we introduce when our target audience consists of fetuses? But we see D'Angelo in his makeshift dragon hospital, and his dad comes in to grill him about spending too much time trying to nurse injured dragons back to health, and instead, he should be acting as Phil's second-in-command to defend the town from Buzz Saw. It is my job to keep everyone around here safe, and I need you as my first lieutenant. Now, I need you out in the field. Huh? Isn't D'Angelo 14? And aren't you the fucking army ranger head of security in charge of the whole base? I just, as head of security- Do you not have employees? What the fuck are you talking about? At first, I assumed he was mentioning this because D'Angelo can be of more use because he has a dragon, and maybe that would make sense, but later in the episode, Phil only almost signs something that completely bans dragons from Rake Town as punishment for D'Angelo not doing what he wants, so I don't know what the fuck is going on. Playtime is over. The more eyes we have watching for Buzz Saw, the better. Do you not have surveillance? We are less than two minutes in and already nothing makes sense, which is pretty standard, so who even cares? Anyway, this inciting incident doesn't mean jack shit regardless, so moving on. In the dragon lair, we catch up with Fuckboy McGee and Bichitron, who are training together apparently. They're machine gunning a bunch of cardboard cutouts of Tom, and I'm side-eyeing the hell out of the showrunners for knowing what it is I do in my downtime and incorporating it into the show. Where did all these Tom standees come from anyway. Hi, Mom. It's a long story. Oh, that's another thing. I guess in whatever amount of time that is not indicated that passed between this season and the last, Olivia overdosed on ketamine and died because she doesn't appear in this season at all. I am not fucking around. She does not appear in a single episode. <laughs> you know, Tom's mom, who had a major screen presence in season five and only appeared in two scenes in season six. Like, I get that her character was slowly becoming entirely useless to your razor thin plots, but no. No scenes at all. I'm more convinced that this was just a practical consequence of them not being able to afford Julia Stiles as a voice actor any longer than they absolutely need her. She is arguably the biggest name in the show. I really hope she's demanding high dollars at least. This show is just a blemish on her fucking resume. Also, remember how one of the major reasons the kids were keeping Buzzsaw's existence in the hidden world a secret from their parents last season was because they were afraid they would think it was too dangerous for them to go down there after learning of him, and that was the main catalyst for the season finale and what made the cliffhanger have any semblance of tension. <laughs> Neither do the showrunners because none of that mattered. Speaking of your mom, I can't believe she trusts you enough to let you go back to the realms now that she knows about Buzzsaw. Come on, I'm her son. I am now at the point where I feel I have to applaud the show for at least doing the 
bare minimum and including this line at all. It is the cheapest, laziest way to explain why the kids can still ride dragons at all, but I am still amazed that this show included it rather than pretending it never happened. So as I said, the plot kind of goes in two directions this time around. After the kids shit all over D'Angelo for wanting to stay in his dragon hospital <laughs> nurse dying dragons back to health instead of going on missions with them. D'Angelo and his dad rescue a hobgobbler choking on one of the base's sensors, and it becomes a sitcom-y, dad didn't want a cat, now we have a cat, now dad loves the cat episode. I would go in more detail about everything that happens with D'Angelo and Phil, but it is the exact same recycled garbage we have seen from every D'Angelo-centric episode since the start of the show. Only this time it comes to a head when Phil admits that he wants D'Angelo to become a ranger like him instead of a veterinarian. You hate the fact that I want to be an animal vet and not an army vet. I thought all this animal stuff was just a phase that you would ultimately follow in my footsteps. I knew it! And maybe that would be a more compelling plot if we'd seen D'Angelo's obsession with being a dragon doctor have any type of negative connotation aside from Phil being moderately inconvenienced for a singular episode. But nothing about what D'Angelo is doing is bad. He is taking responsibility in saving injured and sick dragons out of the kindness of his heart, and both his father and friends treat him like shit for it. And will continue to do so for the rest of the fucking season. I mean, if it's the screenwriter's goal to get me to like D'Angelo more by having everyone around him act like pricks for the sake of convenient plot, then it worked, I guess. So to move on to the other plot of the episode, Tom decides to stage a mission to get the dragon book back from Buzzsaw without D'Angelo, and the rest of the group grills him, saying that they're a team and they have to do everything together. And how many fucking times have we done this. I swear to god, every two episodes there's a plot where the kids, after everything is said and done, learn, we're a team, we have to trust each other and do everything with open communication, and they keep fucking doing it! Is there seriously no other conflict you can put these assholes through? And if you think this is irritating already, then buckle in because the literal running theme of this season is the kids fighting with each other over the dumbest, most minuscule reasons possible and the show treating it like it's some serious conflict with any stake. So get ready for that bullshit. But anyways, Tom and the others go to the Ice Realm to try and stage a mission to collect the book from Buzzsaw and his race-changing Henchman. Oh yeah, this is the obligatory explaining who Winston is part of the review for those just hopping on the Nine Realms train. This is Winston. Winston is black. Well, in the episode he was introduced in back in season two, there was a scene where he was not black, he was white. It went down as the most batshit animation error I have ever seen. I memed it to hell and back. And since his return in season five, it has happened two more times since then. He on occasion changes races in the middle of the episode, and it's pretty much become the Where's Waldo of the Nine Realms, so keep your eyes peeled. But anyways, Tom tries to sneak in and get the book back, and of course he fucks up. And while all of this is going on, Phil and D'Angelo also go to the Ice Realm to find the missing injured Hobgobbler. He's heading back to the Dragon World. There's no time to get Plowhorn, I'm climbing down. Yes, let's just scale this 50 foot drop, traverse this miles long frozen tundra filled with wild deadly dragons on foot. There's no time for the 10 minute walk it would take me to get my dragon from the lair. Maybe D'Angelo is a dumbass who shouldn't be in charge of a hospital, but to be fair, look what he's surrounded by. You'd most likely lose brain cells if you had to deal with these assholes every day too. So by some fucking grace of God, they find the Hobgobbler, but they also find a speed stinger, which they may manage to ward off and D'Angelo even treats it. And as I have pointed out with pretty much every fucking dragon this show introduces from the previous franchise, this would never happen. Speed stingers can't be trained. The only time the OG writers ever came close was when they adopted a baby who was injured and it became part of their pack for a singular episode. This is a raptor-sized scorpion with teeth that could bite your dick off at any second. But of course nothing happens and D'Angelo's dad realizes how great his son is at veterinary work and blah 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 he's proud of him. And meanwhile Buzzsaw shoots a ballista at the kids which I guess he learned to build from the dragon book where we saw him idolizing Dagger's picture last season. I don't have to read the words in order to follow the pictures. How? Whatever it doesn't even matter but this Tom Alex moment does. <laughs> Alex! 
Enjoy it. Enjoy it now. Because you will be in pain after this episode. Trust me. You're always welcome! Hold up! Wait a minute! Oh, come on. Shut the fuck up. You made him white again? God damn, that faulty lighting really comes back to fuck you in the ass, doesn't it? Come on! Maybe. Maybe in some alternate universe, we can let one inexplicable whitewashing of a black character slide? But that makes one, two, three, four separate times now. At least it's in the extreme background of a shot this time and not directly in focus, but fuck me, dude. I mean, I still love it because it's ridiculous and makes no fucking sense at all, but come on. So anyways, I originally assumed that because both groups were in the ice realm that they would somehow meet with D'Angelo and the kids would work together or something, but nope. The episode just ends with D'Angelo treating the dragons in his dragon hospital, with Tom admitting that it is an important thing to have, and D'Angelo was right, and he should have waited for him to help on the mission, and who the fuck cares? This was such a passable episode, I can't even make jokes about it. And I know that sounds par for the course with this show, but ending season 6 with this and starting season 7 with this this makes me feel like this episode was written while the screenwriters were in the fucking Squidward alone dimension. No thoughts, head empty type shit. I swear chat GPT could have written this episode using sewn together scraps from every other D'Angelo centric episode combined. Is this what they're putting people through at DreamWorks? I know I ask every review, but I feel like I'm getting closer to the mark every time. <laughs> All right, you've spent enough time in training. Do you think that you have what it takes to truly dispose of our pesky know-it-all YouTuber? Uh, sure. Perfect. Now, we have the target location. All you have to do is eliminate her. Uh, yeah, about that. Don't you think this is gonna be a little messy? Don't worry, we have a wonderful damage control team. That can handle a murder. Well, yeah, we already slaughtered Hiccup and Toothless's story. What's a dead body? Makes sense. Don't forget to savor it. Episode 2 is titled Hearts of Heroes, and fuck me. It's here, guys. The episode where Tom and June become an official couple. The Nine Realms blindsided, if you will. <laughs> Ah, oh, fuck. That is never a sentence that should be put into the universe, ever. Now, if you've followed this series so far, or at least my reviews of the series, then you'll know all too well how I feel about the Tom and June dynamic. June is probably my most hated character out of any fictional piece of media I've ever consumed due to her constant whining, belittling of her friends, emotional manipulation, and the showrunner's incessant need to make her do all of that while painting her as a good character who we're supposed to look up to all the while. And Tom, while a huge dumbass who somehow manages to make every terrible decision imaginable and never learns from his mistakes, is a character I feel terrible for simply due to the fact that June treats him so horribly and he just kind of takes it. But hey, they were male and female childhood friends at one point, which means they grow up to be romantic interests, because fiction. Because all childhood friendships in fiction turn into unwavering love. Just look at uh, Katniss and Gale. Yeah, yeah, that worked out great. Or, for a more recent example, Violet and Dane. You know, the childhood best friend nice guy who the whole fandom loves. Yeah, yeah, everyone ships Dane and Violet. <clears throat> for all my fourth wing girlies out there. But at the very least, the showrunners spared us from the terror of watching the two of them kiss this season. All they really end up doing is holding hands, so you can put your barf bags away for now. The episode begins in the giant realm that we were introduced to last season as the kids are taking down a bunch of flags that Buzzsaw left around to mark his territory, I guess. Where he obtained these flags, I don't know, and why he's erecting them when they're there's no humans in the hidden world besides the kids who already know that he's down there, I also don't know. Why is he marking his territory when the kids are already aware of his existence and trying to locate and fight him off and... So then we get to the glorious inciting incident of Hearts of Heroes, which is Eugene pointing out that Tom and June are always spending time together and accusing Tom of having a crush on her. Just admit that you like my sister. Well, sure, Eugene. We all like June. I... 
What the fuck am I supposed to say? I did not think it was possible to be gaslit by a children's television show, but I'll be god damned if that is not exactly what's happening. I can just picture them in the writing room for this episode saying, look, we have accidentally made June the most manipulative, hated protagonist in DreamWorks history. We all know it. But we still have to convince the audience that she's a good character that they're supposed to like. Oh, I got an idea. Yeah, why don't we just write a line of dialogue where someone says, everyone likes June. And then the audience will like her because we told them that everyone likes her and that's how TV works. <laughs> and then Eugene goes on to say that it's obvious Tom has romantic feelings for June, and I'm just sitting here like, fucking is it? Do they even like each other at all? Because yes, the show shoehorns them together all the time, especially leading up to this, but most of the time they act like they can't fucking stand each other. Gaslighting, you learned it from the Nine Realms first, kids. So anyways, Tom gets all nervous and spouts out a bunch of shit that offends June. <laughs> Wouldn't, wouldn't that be like super weird? Like, like, like June. I, uh, she's weird. That, that no, she's not. That, that's just really a stretch. It's, uh... Apparently, they aren't close enough friends for her to not go off the fucking rails by Tom calling her weird. So she flies off in a rage, and Tom follows her. Of course. Then we get to the real conflict where Buzzsaw corners the two of them against this giant tree, and the two get stuck inside with this colony of wood chipper dragons and are forced to work together to get out while also realizing that they're in love by the end of the episode. Now I know what a lot of you are going to say. Oh my god, whatever romantic bullshit they're about to fist fuck this episode with is going to be terrible. There's no way they can actually handle Tom and June becoming a couple in an effective way, can they? And you won't be surprised to hear that I actually think that the showrunners handled Tom and June becoming a couple in the best way they possibly could. And you will see exactly what I mean by that once I show you the greatness that is the ship setting sail. Look, I don't need to stress the fact that I and my entire audience fucking hates this pairing. Or more specifically, June, because she is one of the most textbook manipulative characters I have ever seen in media. But contrary to what my audience thinks, there are people who actually like Tom and June. People who hold them as the modern day Hickstrid, an iconic pairing for a new generation, if you will. Yes, they do exist, I'm not making that up. And you know what? Good for them. I'm glad they're able to get some fucked up enjoyment out of all of this, but as your certified Dragons fandom representative, I figured it was my job to put all of this to the test in the most literal sense imaginable. So here's what we're gonna do. If June is, in fact, a good character, who cares about Tom and is a great role model for all the kiddos watching this, then let's try this little experiment. Every time June says or does something toxic for the remainder of the season, I'm going to take a shot. And because June is such a great character, I should be completely sober by the end of this review, so let's start the clock. So now Tom and June are stuck in this massive tree and have to figure a way out while Buzzsaw attempts to chop it down around them. We should find a way out. I'm sure you don't want to be stuck in here with Manny longer than you have to be. All right, well, that didn't take long, did it? It's okay, I'm sure that was just a one-off occurrence. <coughs> oh, 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 that got everywhere. Oh, oh, oh damn. It burns, it burns. <laughs> I could not have made that any messier than it was. No, it was the first one too. Oh, that is so foul. Oh, I didn't buy any shot glasses. I gotta shoot it straight, but it's okay because I will definitely not be doing that very often after this, right? So the wood chipper dragons get agitated with June and Tom being there. Who can blame them? Ugh, we wouldn't even be in this position if Eugene had just kept his big mouth shut. More like this wouldn't have happened if he didn't give a big cringy speech about how unlikable and weird I am. To be fair, just kidding. I better be careful about insulting June from now on because clearly two people hating each other's guts is a mark of attraction in this show. So Tom realized realizes that the key to getting out is to bond with the wood chippers, but for some reason, every time he gets close to doing so, they turn and attack. It's determined that since they're a colony of dragons, that a queen is likely at the helm, so they attempt to go find her. Nice work, June. Guess it's actually a good thing I'm around. I never said I didn't like having you around. It's all right, Tom, I'll say it. <coughs> Guys, I really don't drink. 
best straight liquor ever. We are really pulling no punches here, are we? Oh, and meanwhile, Eugene, Alex, and D'Angelo kidnap Buzzsaw's race-changing henchmen and attempt to get information out of them, and it is the only saving grace of this entire episode. <gasps> when Feathers eats, she starts at the toes and slowly works her way up to the head. So Tom and June locate the queen and all seems well as Tom attempts to bond with her and... Careful, Tom. If you mess this up, you'll be stuck in here with me forever. And we both know you'd hate that. I like to think of this as a literal bottle of June's toxicity, only instead of being filtered through a screen and slowly killing the audience, it's being filtered through my liver and slowly killing specifically me. It's getting a little bit easier. Never mind. <coughs> How am I already about to throw up? Uh, I need a minute. <laughs> I need a minute. God damn it. Y'all think that this is just like a, a joke or something? It's real. I fucking wish I was faking this, guys. Oh, I haven't drank in so long either. This is gonna be painful. I especially love how pointless that was. Tom wasn't saying shit and is actively trying to get them out of the giant tree before Buzzsaw cuts it down and destroys these dragons' whole ecosystem, but June just had to insult him at this very moment. But it's okay, guys, because she's gonna train the queen instead. Show us how it's done, June. <laughs> think I'm so repulsive. What would you have said if Eugene said that to you? That's dumb. It, it doesn't matter what I would have said. Oh, so hanging out with me is dumb. No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. You're being stupid. <laughs> you scared her and now here comes her whole colony. That's it. We're the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but no. The two realize that their arguing is what's aggravating the dragons, and in order to get out, they have to figure out what the problem is between them and air it out, which is a bit of a tall order if you ask me, because I don't think Dr. Phil would take on whatever laundry list of toxic issues June has going for her. Why do, why do I have to start? Because you started this whole thing. If you're so sure about what the right thing to say is, why don't you say it? Because you're supposed to. Ugh, never mind. This is pointless. See? So the others get out of the henchmen that Buzzsaw went after Tom and June, which is dumb because obviously. And back in the tree, we get the scene, everyone. The scene. I didn't say it before because I didn't want to mess up our friendship or like, you know, but I like you. Like, like, like you. Jesus fucking Christ. Why does this dialogue feel like it was written by someone who sees campy 90s sitcoms as Shakespeare? I like you too, Collarson. Like, like. Like, you know, like you. Like, like, like. Like, like. Like you. Like, like, like. Like, like you. Like, 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 like. Just like, 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 like. This is a moment we've been theoretically building to for seven seasons, and the fact that people saw this and felt any type of catharsis for Tom and June's romance makes me lose faith in mankind. These two act like they can't stand each other's presence 99% of the time, but hey, if the words on the piece of paper read by the voice actor says it must be true, then it must be true, right? So they break out of the tree after taming the wood chipper dragons, just as the others show up to help them ward off Buzzsaw, and of course, everything's fine. I mean, as fine as a person can be now being tied to this. Uh, don't smile at each other! I'm right here! Oh, come on, guys! Webs, look away! Ugh. And there it is, folks. Tom and June's Blindsided. For those unaware, Blindsided was the episode in season four of Dragon's Race to the Edge where Hiccup and Astrid finally became official after an injury that leaves Astrid blind forces them to put trust in one another. And it's through this dependence that they come to terms with their feelings for each other. I won't go in much detail because I already did that in another video, another much longer video that you can go watch right now, but it was really the perfect formula for getting Hiccup and Astrid together. 
father, Astrid the independent warrior who has to relinquish her trust and find that no matter what, Hiccup will always be there for her and vice versa. So you're probably holding on to that statement I made earlier about Hearts of Heroes being the perfect way for Tom and June to become official as well. And yes, I believe it is. Because tell me a more perfect way for these two to get together than an episode dedicated to June doing nothing but insulting and demeaning him and him clapping back in response just for the two of them to be essentially forced into admitting they like each other for the sake of nothing besides their own survival. You fucking can't. This is glorious. Tom and June's blindsided is nothing but a toxic cesspool of despair and anger and I genuinely cannot think of a more perfect way for them to become official. Congratulations DreamWorks, you did your job in the shoddiest way possible and I expected nothing less. Speaking of shots, I'm putting this aside for now. I am feeling things inside me. But at least June's done being a bitch now that her and Tom are a thing. Right? <laughs> Episode 3 is titled Heart of Glass and focuses on the kids discovering the new desert realm, I guess. Wow. Episode 2 was called Hearts of Heroes. Episode 3 is called Heart of Glass. So, were you guys paid in Chuck E. Cheese tokens to write these titles? We also see the return of Sled Bitch and Linda in this episode, and as insignificant as that sounds, I promise you it is even more pointless than you can possibly imagine. Remember how we last saw her after she full-on shocked shanked her way into the hidden world, blew up a group of children, then ran from everyone when she was about to be held accountable? Well now she's back somehow, because this show doesn't need just one stupid excuse for an antagonist, it needs two! The episode begins as the dragons are fucking around in the general store, making everyone's lives hell, and it leaves me questioning once again why they're even allowed up here. Shit, Tom even has a line saying, sorry, we shouldn't have left you alone for so long. Where the fuck did you idiots go to that you're dragons couldn't. School? Is that still a thing in this show? I'm pretty sure the last time they were in school was season three. Will these questions ever be answered? Probably not. But there's a two second foreshadowy scene where Tom tells Thunder he needs to assert his dominance as the leader, I guess. And then the kids go to the nature realm where Alex's sensors are going off. And what the fuck? Where did you get that? I have to presume that when Sledbitch and Linda took off in nothing but a van at the end of last season that they've just been hermits living in the forest since then. Yeah, get used to things just spawning into existence at the convenience of the screenwriters, assuming you weren't already, which would be incredibly surprising. And why is Linda still here? Oh, uh, yeah. I kinda work for her now. Pennies aren't great, but it beats unemployment. <laughs> Damn. Point made. So Sledbitch is back to mine more dragon sight, that oxygen producing crystal she's so obsessed with. I will never not point out the absurdity of Sledbitch, the world renowned scientist, being more interested in claiming fame for discovery of a green fucking rock than a limitless world of undiscovered mythological creatures but K. Okay. Although we do get a pretty sick upgrade from where she was last season, because at least then she accidentally blew up a group of children. This time they just turn her into a full-on terrorist who drops dynamite with the intent of killing them all. That's why I brought along an insurance policy to guarantee that my operation would not be deterred. Dr. Slaken! <gasps> Let's eat! Oops! <laughs> But hey, if Sledbitch hadn't tried blowing them all up, they wouldn't have discovered the new entrance to the desert realm that was blown open by her. See, kids? Terrorism can be so fun and productive. <laughs> Shit. So they enter the desert realm? I guess. All right, I keep saying I guess because at this point, seven seasons into the show, as a person who has sat through every single episode of this shit multiple times since the beginning, if you held a gun to my head and told me to name every single one of the realms they've introduced so far by name, there would be a bullet in my head right now. There's a point at the end of this episode where they realize that the nine realms of Norse mythology has something to do with the dragon realms, and I assumed they were going to list all of them off then, but they fucking don't. 
don't. And I was just fucking befuddled that in a show called The Nine Realms, it took over a year and a half before the title was ever remotely explained. Remember when I ranted about that in my season two review and everyone in the comments was like, uh, Audrey, it's clearly based on the Nine Realms of Norse mythology. You're just stupid. Well, congratulations, professional hall monitors. Your wet dream is finally coming true. It only took 21 months of blue balls. Hope it was worth it. So the kids look around for Sled Bitch and Linda because I guess after blasting the entrance to the realm open, they went inside? somehow? But 30 seconds later, they come running and are perfectly fine buddying up with the riders in the face of danger. Did you not just try to fucking blow their bones out of their bodies two minutes ago? Are the screenwriters trolling or do they actually think they're writing a Roadrunner episode? Because that would explain a few things. Hey, speaking of trolls. <laughs> <sighs> Jesus Christ. How many times this episode are these fuckers gonna be blown up without losing any goddamn limbs? How do you still have legs? I hope Tom is the one to lose them too, and don't give him any prosthetics either, because God forbid this show get its hands on another prosthetic limb. So everyone gets chased by this new glass caster dragon, which is pretty reminiscent of the sandbuster dragon from Race to the Edge in the sense that it creates glass using its fire, although it does have a pretty cool unique ability to both sense and disorient its prey through vibrations in the glass formations that it makes. The kids are separated from their dragons, and we do get a fair amount of nice dialogue-free scenes with Thunder coming into his leadership role while trying to assemble the other startled dragons away from Tom, although it would probably mean a bit more if Tom and Thunder were more established as leaders rather than every character just telling us that they're leaders for several seasons now, despite there being virtually no examples of them acting as such. Shit, Thunder hasn't even used used his supposed alpha ability since last season, and he will continue to not use it, so that's not part of it. But anyways, Tom actually debates the others on whether or not they can trust the woman who just tried blowing them up with a bomb. She does have a history of trying to blow us up. I know, I know, but this time it was just a distraction. I don't trust her, but I trust you. Look, should we, um, you know, have let them go first? Tom would never leave us behind. He's one of those heroic types, a do-gooder like his mother. It's called thinking ahead. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got me. That was pretty great. I'm pissed that it took this long for our main character to make a single logical decision, but as a starving person does, I will gobble up that breadcrumb of logic. So Thunder and the other dragons disorient the glass caster and... <laughs> So Sled Bitch and Linda escaped by using the Dragon Sight crystal to cut through the glass. Dragon Sight. It's harder than a diamond, remember? Which means... You can cut through glass. What? I... <sighs> What the fuck ever. And the episode ends with Fuckboy McGee and Bitchatron researching Norse mythology. Nine realms. Fire? Ice? Giant? Today's realm makes seven, which means... There are still two more left. You know what? I don't even feel like actively digging to see if that statement is even true within the context of the show. I'll save the whole these realms aren't kept track of at all rant for my season eight review because at least then we'll know of all of them, maybe? But one thing's for sure, it's not going to be remotely accurate to actual Norse mythology in any way. If I can say anything with certainty, it's that this show has no interest in making faithful translations of existing materials that people all across the globe know and love. Just fucking wait. Episode 4 is titled In the Cards and focuses on the kids splitting up after they can't stop arguing with each other. Wait, isn't that the plot of literally every episode but by the end they decide to trust each other and work as a team, then it resets the next episode and they're back to not trusting each other again? Yes. But this time it actually has a lasting impact that carries into the rest of the season. Breaking new ground, everyone. The episode begins with nobody caring about anything the introverted nerd with glasses has to say. Shocking. And everyone getting pissed at each other for really petty reasons. Like D'Angelo spending time at his dragon hospital caring for injured dragons and not spending time with the rest of the group. Because how dare he. And because of all of this, June comes up with a completely June-like solution. A tarot card reading. 
<laughs> All right, someone more educated on the topic explained how terribly the show gets its depiction of tarot card reading wrong, because I can pretty much promise you they did. <sighs> okay, now just relax and let your energy do all the work. Hmm. The five of coins. <gasps> The tower. If I'm reading these correctly, they all point to our team breaking up. And this starts an argument over literally nothing. Sure, maybe he spends a little too much time at the hospital lately, but whatever. I support him. In fact, we probably get along even better than you and Colorson. Since you support me spending so much time at the hospital. Alex, we've been friends longer than you've even known, Eugene. Dee, don't listen to him. Don't tell me what to do! What the fuck is wrong with you people? They are literally getting in arguments over how much they like each other. You do realize we are arguing about how well we all get along? No! You are not going to get away with it just by having the best character in the show point out the obvious. So then the actual plot of the episode kicks in, where an unknown dragon is running rampant around Rake Town, and they figure out that it's a- Holy shit, is that a typhoomerang? This show actually remembered that those exist. I'm sorry, I know I've brought up the fact that they made razor whips make fire tornadoes despite them never having that ability prior, while that is literally what Typhoomerangs are known for in every single video now, but I just can't get over how stupid it was. Especially since you apparently remembered that the dragon species is a thing. Not that they really do anything significant in this episode besides tear some shit up and do some mating dance over Icarus that the dragons stop, but it's never really explained why it snuck out of the hidden world. I guess because Raytown is covered in fake eels, which are the dragon food source, but still. How did no one notice this? Ah, uh, the ketamine. I keep forgetting. Let's split up for some aerial recon. Splitting up is a bad idea. If a dragon is out there, we need to find it fast. Do you want to risk breaking up? Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't think of it that way. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about this weird subplot, but it was actually the highlight of the episode. And it's the fact that in the cards turns Tom into the definition of a Reddit nice guy simp for the entire runtime, and I was laughing my ass off. Basically, Eugene gets in Tom's head about the breakup the tarot cards indicated actually being about Tom and June's relationship. I fucking wish. And because he doesn't want that to happen, Tom spends the entire episode agreeing with literally everything June says in shitting bricks every time she gets even the slightest bit upset with him. So pretty much their entire relationship anyways. I can't be a dragon, right? You make an excellent point, June. Oh, nice guy! Okay. It was easily the funniest thing to come out of this entire season, aside from Alex's wittiness, which is on another level this time around. This would have been way easier if I had just hacked a satellite and used that to search for whatever might be out here. Isn't that illegal? Ish? So they try to ward off the Typhoomerang, but there turns out to be two, and they engage in a mating dance over Project Icarus that threatens to destroy it, and the insufferable, pointless arguing reaches its peak in the most annoying way possible. What are we gonna do, June? I don't know! Why don't you make a decision for once today? I got it in my head that the breakup the cards were predicting was about us. I like the Tom that isn't afraid to say what he thinks. Ha! I'm counting that shit. We have watched this girl mentally abuse Tom for the past seven seasons anytime he does something she doesn't like, and then she hits us with that. Cheers, motherfuckers. I need a fucking chaser or something. What am I doing with my life? All right, to make this even more legit, I'm gonna be chasing it down with some Mike's Hard. That is 20,000 times better, oh my god. Tom is the definition of a Reddit nice guy. I called it from the beginning with my playing Fortnite and jerking off to anime joke in season one. And we have come a long way, literally. So the group fights over nothing and not even Alex's sassiness can save the scene, although I appreciate the effort. Guys, this is not the time to argue. Why don't you ask the tarot cards how to stop the Typhoomerangs? They know everything, right? And then the dragons say fuck this shit and take care of the Typhoomerangs on their own and then the group breaks up. For real this time. Let's go, pal. What the fuck? Hold on.
lasting consequences in this show. I mean, it's for the dumbest reason imaginable, but they actually stay dismantled for the rest of the season-ish. You know, I would have really appreciated any type of justified and long-established reason for this happening rather than just a series of petty arguments the screenwriters pulled out of their ass last minute for substance, but it's something, I guess. Although I do find it hilarious that all this was inadvertently June's fault, because who the fuck else's fault would it be? Come on. Name one person. Yep, didn't think so. Episode 5 is titled Eugene's Lean, Mean, Extreme, Dream Team- Alright. Where did the asshole go that wrote those lazy titles? Bring him back, this is just annoying. The episode focuses on Eugene building a new dragon riding team because he misses the old group. And I'm gonna spoil it right now that this is probably the least good Eugene-centric episode so far in the show, but it is still a Eugene-centric episode nonetheless, so it is much more enjoyable for that reason. Case in point- My name's Tom, and I have yellow hair. And my grandpa's grandpa was a dragon nerd too. Blah, blah, blah. I'm June. Who wants to hear about some lame myths? Nobody? Well, I'll tell you anyway. My sensors are sensing something. Time to make a snarky comment. A snark, snark, snark. <laughs> <laughs> so after getting rejected by all the other kids and barfing at Tom and June, Tom and Juning in front of him. Oh, barf. No, no thank you. Hard pass. Eugene goes off to the ice realm for some reason and sporadically decides that he needs to build his own dragon riding team, which consists of Alex's mothers. And the next 10 minutes is just Eugene pulling together adults from around Project Icarus, and by adults I mean Alex's mothers and this asshole named Pete, to train them in dragon riding, and I don't fucking get this at all. Now, if you're familiar with the dragon series, you probably recognize this plotline as similar to Astrid's A team from Race to the Edge, where an auxiliary team of dragon riders is formed and trained by Astrid for the sake of Burke having suitable defense from enemies while the OG dragon riders are away at Dragon's Edge. But in that show, it had a legitimate purpose within the context of the story, because it had multiple facets. It was a way for the show to introduce an additional set of dragon riders that consistently made appearances in missions and coming episodes until the very end of the show. And it was also a great episode for Astrid's character, as she was doing it in an effort to protect her family who was almost killed during one of Dagger's attacks. And in the Nine Realms, Eugene creates a new team because he's lonely, and there is literally no significance outside of this episode because the additional riders are never utilized again. Shit, I assume they would at the very least come into play during the battle of this episode, but they fucking don't. They are trained for this one singular sequence and they are never shown using that training for anything. Shit, at this point I've seen season 8, I know how the show ends, and I thought that they would come into play at some point during the next season, but they fucking don't. So obviously I am obliged to ask, what the fuck was the point of even- Ew, the brony flashlight is back, why? And meanwhile, Fuckboy McGee and Bitchatron are going on a date, and while passing through the ice realm, they discover that Sledbitch and Buzzsaw are now in cahoots, and they just kind of hang out until shit goes down. They literally do nothing but observe and conveniently show up to rescue Eugene later on in the episode at the same time Alex and D'Angelo show up, and they all start fighting for no reason. Hey, remember how last season I said to assume that with every cut I make there's at least a two minute scene of Eugene being needlessly stupid that I skipped over? Well this season, just assume that every time I cut the footage there's at least a two minute scene of the kids bickering over useless shit that I also skipped over. You guys went on your own mission? Well, what about you? What are you two doing here? We came looking for Eugene. So you're on a rescue mission and you didn't call us? How long were you going to keep the Buzzsaw and Sledkin team up from us? We weren't keeping anything. After my new team failed. You made your own team? You guys... Anyways, if I sound all over the place with this episode, it's because that's exactly how it feels. There are a few great, uh, not great, good moments between Alex and Eugene where she scolds him for putting her moms in danger and tells him he's a terrible leader, then feels bad about it after he disappears to the ice realm and recruits D'Angelo and Plowhorn to help track him down, but she also never apologizes for it? I don't know if the screenwriter just forgot they showed her feeling apologetic or if she was just more angry with him after he went off to the ice realm to, uh, 
Wait, why the fuck did Eugene go to the Ice Realm? To attack the flamethrowers for no reason? What the fuck is happening in this fucking episode? I think I just like seeing scenes with these two because they have the only decent chemistry out of any of the kids and they have historically had really great episodes together. But here, just as this is a very bottom of the barrel Eugene episode, it is also lazy in terms of the Alex and Eugene dynamic, which I feel like you have to actually try to get wrong. But anyways, back to the villain villains, quote unquote. Buzzsaw and Sledbitch are now teamed up because Sledbitch wants to keep mining Dragon Sight, but she's in Buzzsaw's territory, I guess. Hidden World's pretty fucking big. Don't know why she needs to do it here, but she does, I guess. And he won't let her unless she translates the Dragon Book for him, which she agrees to. And this is the excuse they use to get the big bads together. Lovely. So everyone comes in to rescue Eugene, and by the end of the episode, everyone's still pissed at each other, and the episode ends with them all somberly standing around pissed at each other. Wait a minute. Wasn't this the exact end of the last episode? Alright then. I hope this helps prove my point of how fucking useless this episode was. If you took it out, it would change absolutely nothing besides the Buzzsaw Sled Bitch team up, which barely has anything to do with anything. Nothing with Eugene's dragon riding team comes into play again. Eugene and Alex never reconcile the fight they had, and everyone's still being dumb and petty for no reason. Oh, I see. You finally have a conflict that spans through multiple episodes, and you don't have the capacity to create more of that, so you're stretching it out for an obnoxious long time and hoping that the children watching this series don't notice. This is such a sad existence. And I'm not just referring to me reviewing it. Is live action Audrey still okay, by the way? <laughs> oh, lightning orgasms. <laughs> Episode 6 is titled, My Immortal. I mean, welcome to the Black Parade. I mean, Alex turns emo. I mean, 404 Alex not found. Yes, that last one was serious. But hey, we have a Eugene-centric episode and an Alex-centric episode back to back. Just because the Eugene episode was lackluster doesn't mean the Alex one will be too. Right? And we start off with Buzzsaw and Sledbitch scheming in this mysterious villain lair that spawned out of their asses. They accomplish nothing and their existence is pointless, just like the rest of this show. Then we cut to Alex wearing a black sweater instead of her usual green sweater because, yeah, I purposefully didn't bring up the plot until now. It revolves around Alex getting fed up with everyone asking her to do stuff and not giving her the space she wants, so she runs off and is found by Buzzsaw and has a quasi-villain arc. So... <laughs> Why is Alex wearing black? I see, she's an introvert, which equates to her needing to have an emo scene kid phase, because that's how it works. And as an introvert, I resent that. I never had an emo kid phase, although I kind of wish I did. It would have been way better than the delayed puberty phase I had instead. But the reason this is so funny to me is because she only wears black for this episode, and come the season finale, she's back to normal. God damn the depth. I mean, it's better than Eugene, I guess. What does he wear this episode, you ask? Oh, nothing. Actually. Bitch, what the fuck? What the fuck? I mean, they say it's because he's going swimming at the beginning of the episode, but then he just stays naked. Why are there so many naked people in this show? First D'Angelo, then Phil, now Eugene. Even Race to the Edge didn't go this far. And those characters were all of age, for Christ's sake. So we start out with everyone pestering Alex with their tech problems, and when she thinks she's finally alone, they gang up on her, and tell her that her tablet AI friend isn't as important as her real friends. And as an introvert who spends 99% of her time talking about fake people rather than interacting with real people, I resent that as well. It's not just a fake tablet friend. Wendy is an incredibly sophisticated AI system. This is yet another conflict scene from this season that I do not understand. The screenwriters want there to be a lasting reason why the kids are split apart, and that's the problem, because they don't know how to write anything different from the same shit they've been doing for seven seasons. So instead of writing episodes focused on what the kids are doing individually, or God forbid giving them arcs to act on, they just pull all the kids back together anyways and fill the runtime with pointless banter. And maybe I wouldn't have to rely on her so much if you guys didn't use me as your own personal IT department. Oh, come on, Alex. You're being dramatic. Bitch. I will put up with a lot of shit, but June has the audacity to speak that way to our queen. I'm taking a shot just for spite. This one's for you, Alex. Uh. 
I commend you for living on the same plane of existence as that purple-eyed Oh, fuck, I'm not allowed to say that, am I? <laughs> liquor. It's definitely the liquor. So after one of the dumbest conflict scenes ever, Thunder ends up frying Alex's tablet, so she flies off in anger and ends up encountering Buzzsaw in the Crystal Realm. Then the real conflict of the episode begins when he kidnaps Feathers and Alex manipulates him by talking about the fact that she isn't a dragon rider anymore and he instills trust in her to lead him to a place in the dragon manual he stole. And I genuinely wish that I had more to say about the content of this episode, since it is Alex-centric, but by virtue of Buzzsaw taking up so much of it and the other kids existing. There really aren't as many moments for her to shine as you might think. I mean, she gets in her witty one-liners, of course. Everything goes smoothly, we'll come back, and I'll think about showing mercy. Wow, that sounds incredibly reasonable and not at all unhinged. But the reason Buzzsaw wants Alex to lead him to a specific place in the book is because he's trying to find a quote-unquote death dragon depicted in its pages, which ends up being Jormungandr, as we'll find out. But Alex ends up leading him astray as a ploy to get the other kids to notice that she's missing by meticulously destroying a line of her sensors that will lead them to her location. Because meanwhile, the kids have successfully managed to get her tablet working again, and there is absolutely no way she could have known this. So in reality, Alex is just destroying these sensors because because she doesn't want anyone to find Buzzsaw's body, I guess. But anyways, the kids find Buzzsaw's race-changing henchmen guarding feathers, and hey look, Thunder's doing the toothless meme dance! No, 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 not that one. The OG one. You know, from movie three. Don't you recognize the meme, guys? I do find it quite ironic that they 100% threw this end to fill runtime as a way to distract the audience from the fact that virtually nothing else is happening. And eventually, they follow the broken sensors into the crystal maze thing, find Alex and Buzzsaw, and and Alex kills them. Fire! Hey, look, if anyone was gonna do it, it was gonna be Alex. I'm just pissed that it took this long. I also love how they phrase this as some type of bait and switch when she's clearly just playing along with Buzzsaw so she can get the book back. Like, look at this fucking shot. Look at me. I should have listened to them when they told me MCR would lead me down this path. What have I become? So Buzzsaw, who now sees Alex as his friend because she murdered the rest of the kids, trusts her with the dragon book. And of course, she declares her loyalty to her real friends, blah blah blah, they save the day and get the book back. And back in Buzzsaw and Sled Bitch's lair, she scolds him for losing the book, and turns out it doesn't even fucking matter. Apparently, Sled Bitch saw my season 5 review where I point out the obvious fact that Tom could have easily taken pictures of the book on his phone rather than carry around the precious one of a kind artifact like a dumbass because that's exactly what she did. And back in the dragon lair, Alex gives them the book and they give her her fixed tablet and the kids do the whole, are we cool now? No, we're not cool now thing for the third fucking episode in a row. But only after praising Alex for being so badass, which I commend. Who knew Alex could read the book of dragons? I totally knew. Oh, I can't read a word of it. That she couldn't read a word of it? I lied like a big old liar. You've been spending too much time around June, my queen. Then she shows them what it was Buzzsaw was looking for, and... Is that the Dark Realm? What? What? What the fuck? No, 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 don't play the outro music. Don't fucking end the episode. Explain your shit for once, the Nine Realms. What the fuck ever. I don't even care. I just want this season to be done. Episode 7 is titled Rise of Jormungandr, and it is the seventh season finale of The Nine Realms. Although I personally wouldn't refer to it as an episode, it's more like 22 continuous minutes of the dumbest, most contrived excuses for a conflict any show has the audacity to put to streaming. And that's not even including all the shit it does to further assassinate Hiccup and Toothless's story, but at the very least, disrespecting the original franchise's source material is to be expected at this point. But with one season left to go, I kind of assumed the conflicts between characters would become somewhat relevant and not completely meaningless, but of course I was wrong. We open the episode with Buzzsaw in the Dark Realm, apparently, and he's looking for the death dragon he was after last episode. And this scene literally lasts for less than 20 seconds. Then we're in Rake Town again. Where the fuck is Buzzsaw's Timberjack during this? Why is he still alive? How are you not dead? I have no idea! Anyways, cut to June trying to translate the dragon book. Any luck deciphering the Dark Realm page of the book? 
We have to find it before Buzzsaw. Okay, I am not kidding you. I went through the entire season trying to see if there was a point where the Dark Realm was even hinted at before now. Besides that stupid ending one-liner of the last episode, and I could not find it. Why do you not develop shit? This is the season finale, the tipping point of all seven episodes, and I don't even know what the fuck the characters are looking for. Anyways, they translate the page about Jormungand who is this mysterious world serpent thing from Norse mythology. The book claims it's the apex predator to all dragons. Okay, I want to make this abundantly clear. I am someone who knows dick all about Norse mythology, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this episode in particular is one of the most offensive whenever it comes to accuracy. Now, I'm not going to become a Google search warrior and try to catch them every time they get something wrong, but I'll include all the clips I can and encourage the actual experts to reign hell in the comments below. So there, disclaimer noted. It probably also explains why dragons are afraid of eels. Look at that thing. All right, John, that's enough cocaine for you. So they find the location of the entrance and start heading towards it, and not even five minutes into the episode, we get our first needless conflict scene. Don't worry, bro. I'm sure Jormungandr will spare you. You smell a bit spoiled. Can we stop snipping ourselves and focus? Let's just do the opposite of whatever Colorson says. Oh, that's nice. No more arguing and no more fighting until we stop Buzzsaw from reaching the world circle. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, I'm sure that's gonna fucking last. Gotta be around here somewhere. I'm not seeing anything, June. Are you sure you read the book correctly? Run. Poor Tom. I'd call for live action, Audrey, but is she still good? What the fuck is happening? June's being a hoe again? Okay. Here's to you! Hope you find the world serpent! Jormund Gandalf, or what the fuck ever his name is. <coughs> find that dragon! You know what they say. A dragon without its rider is a tragedy. And a rider without their dragon is probably getting tongue fucked by Zayden Ryerson on Tyrandor's throne. <laughs> I wish. It's okay, I'll just read about it. Chapter 48, let's fucking go. Anyways, they find the entrance, but there's a... a crystal whip? A crystal whip. What the fuck is a crystal whip? I love when television shows give so little context to their own creations that I have to go to the fan-run wiki to learn anything about it. Subspecies of razor whip. Razor whips were my favorite dragon in the OG franchise, and of course this show had to fuck them over. I guess I finally got my answer as to why this dragon makes fire tornadoes, right? Because it's the guardian of the dark realm and has extra special abilities. Just fuck off. So they see that Buzzsaw poisoned it on his way to the Dark Realm and D'Angelo treats it. I couldn't have done it better myself. You couldn't have done it at all. <clears throat> Sorry. Truce. And once they go into the Dark Realm, they find this red dragon sight everywhere, which will become important later. I mean, I say that relatively, because nothing is important. Especially not with all the needless bickering you're about to endure. Strap in. Well. In Norse mythology, Loki placed his unruly daughter down here, treating it like a creepy prison where she could do no harm. You're afraid of the dark? I'm afraid of what's lurking in the dark. Guys, we promised not to fight on this mission. How are we supposed to find anything out here? Move Plow to the front. Don't try to pin this all on Plowhorn. Hey, watch it. Why is she stopping? Well, we I'm the leader. Us. Can we just I say fly we push over? through or go around? How are we supposed to find anything out here? Why is she Hey, back off Gonzo, Collarson. Don't talk to Tom that way. Yeah, Eugene, only June gets to talk to me that way. <laughs> There's no fucking shot in hell. That's an actual line of dialogue. What the fuck? They aren't even trying to hide it anymore. It's so good. No, Eugene, only June can mentally abuse me like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have a problem. What's wrong? Is she still alive? No, actually, she was dead when I got here. What? How? I think June killed her. Huh. A worthy death. Good work, though. Ah, uh, so what's gonna happen to me now? Well, now you serve no purpose, so I'd run if I were you. 
That's my favorite part. You know, I run a casting agency that recruits people for porn parodies of beloved children's stories, and even I feel gross sitting here. Well, I still need your help. We could use your studio for a project we have planned. Okay, I'm listening. Just a simple BTS with our Nine Realms cast. We plan on bringing in all the actors as a kind of final hurrah for our series finale. Oh cool, that's doable. And I'm too afraid for my life to say no. Perfect. But um, what kind of props are we talking about using here? Because I got a full inventory and I'm looking to exhaust it. Inventory? Yeah, like these handcuffs. Uh, I'm pretty sure you took those from us. Oh. Well, there's always, um... Get out. Quiet! You're all driving me nuts! I wish I'd never met any of you! <gasps> Well, shit. Can I really make a critique anymore? Thanks, D. I've been screaming that for two years now. It's the Red Dragon Sight. It's possible the Red Dragon Sight steam is affecting our serotonin levels, throwing us off and making us mad. Okay, not only is that the dumbest leap in history, even for this show, but y'all have been fighting for the entire goddamn season now, and this Red Dragon Sight has been nowhere. Although if you had told me that June had been keeping some of this on her as part of her holistic mood crystal bullshit this entire show, I'd believe you. In fact, that would explain a lot of shit. No joke, I thought it was going to be revealed that there happened to be Red Dragon Sight in the tree when her and Tom got together earlier this season and that's why she was treating him so terribly, but nope, it was just her. God damn. Oh, what? Did you think the pointless conflict was over yet? Ha! This is why we'll never survive the Dark Realm. None of you can even look at yourselves in the mirror. What have you ever done wrong? I believed in us. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm not even kidding. That might be the most profound line of dialogue ever spoken in this show. And of course it's Eugene that says it. You know, if you're going to make him the punching bag of the group, it's a bit counterproductive to give him the only lines of dialogue in the entire show that make sense. And what a coincidence that he always dissuades the idea of Tom and June being in a relationship. So all the kids admit their wrongdoings and make up in like one minute. After half a season of them doing nothing but bitching and everyone's back to normal for the rest of the episode. Aren't you all still around the Red Dragon site? According to the show's own logic, they are not in control of their emotions because of the physiological effect it has on their serotonin levels. I figured maybe it was going to be revealed that the Red Dragon site doesn't actually do anything and this was just a breaking point for the group, which would be a good cathartic way for them all to realize that they're the problem. It's them. But of course that is not what happens. Why introduce a practical effect for the characters to get angry at one another, and the second they are no longer angry, that practical effect is now useless and doesn't impact them at all. Oh, it's because it was a plot device. So the dragon riders reband and find the lair of Jormungandr, the world serpent. Hey look, more runes that say absolute gibberish. And also, hey look, the strike class symbol, meaning this is yet another site in the hidden world built by Hiccup and Toothless, which is confirmed when we find out that the locking mechanism for the cage can only be opened by a night fury. It is implied that Hiccup 1300 years ago built this cage for Jormungandr to protect dragon and kind and... <laughs> Guys, I'm gonna be completely honest here, I can't go on another rant about how fucked up the showrunners have to be to manipulate Hiccup's story like this. Maybe it wasn't their decision, maybe they were told to do it by the Universal Overlords, I don't know. But I think that pretty much any OG Dragons fan can look at all the shit they've retconned from Hiccup's story over the past seven seasons and make their own opinions on how much they really respect it. And also, I just have far less of an urge to defend them now considering Dean live-action remakes or Lazy Deblua is now doing a live-action How to Train Your Dragon remake. Let's stir up some controversy. Ciara Tyrell asks, what are your thoughts on the rising trend of live-action remakes of animated films? Because I know that there is a project in, uh, in the works for a Lilo and Stitch remake. So this is directly going to relate to things that you had a hand in, not only your general thoughts, but, you know, something that, you, you know, uh, that you worked on. Yeah, uh, 
so my my feeling is that I'm, I'm not really interested in them i haven't seen many of them uh they're made by capable filmmakers and and i don't want to disparage any of the talent or the hard work that went into them i just think that it's lazy on the part of the studio i think it's easy to go back at, to something that was successful that uh, a really talented team put a lot of years and hard work into and then redo it uh, without without changing what worked that to me is a missed opportunity for putting something original into the world that people um years from now are going to cite as such a pivotal movie to them and and one that really meant a lot so there, there are a lot of misfires uh in in filmmaking and not every film can be a, a, an indelible classic but it seems like a missed opportunity to take a budget like that uh, that's required to do a live action remake of an animated movie and then and, and pour it all into it. I would rather see something original. If this franchise and the people running it have proven anything in the past couple of years, it's that the opinions of fans who have supported them since the beginning do not fucking matter. Which is the tragic, unfortunate reality for so many franchises nowadays. But I just have to ask, what is it about this once beautiful trilogy that makes everyone involved with creating it want to stab legacy fans in the back? Except for you, Arden Doug. You two are still cool. And I've been saying for years that Race to the Edge is better than the movies, so bite me. Well, looky what we have here. <laughs> Seems like you found my death dragon. Fucking when? No! Fuck you, show. If I suspend my disbelief any further, my brain is going to melt out of my fucking ears. When did Buzzsaw train the Sky Torture. When did he even find the fucking thing? We haven't seen this dragon since the beginning of season five when it disappeared into the jungle realm, which is nowhere near this place. I went back and checked. I literally sat through the entire season again, trying to figure out if I missed something. A clip where Buzzsaw runs across traces of the Sky Torture. Fucking anything. But nope, of course not. Why would there be? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the goddamn Sky Torture is back for no reason besides they couldn't think of a cool season finale without including something big, I guess. And instead of building to it all season, they just had Buzzsaw yoink the fucking thing out of his ass. May as well, he already pulled a whole goddamn laboratory out of there. All right, guys. Try to keep up. So Tom and the kids get their asses kicked by the Sky Torture, who then pins Tom against the gate of the World Serpent. So to protect Tom, Thunder opens the gate. <laughs> Huh? I know it probably felt like I cut clips there, but no, that was the end of the season. You're all caught up. Are you seriously <laughs> expecting me to even comment on how dumb that was? Allow me to explain the events of this season finale to you in simple terms. Buzzsaw was looking for the lair of the World Serpent because he wants to destroy all of Dragonkind using it. And keep in mind, his motivation is to skin dragons and sell their hides for profit, which he will not be able to do if they're all fucking dead. But regardless, Tom and the kids go down there to stop him from doing this, spend 15 minutes bitching at each other, then finds the lair, which can only be unlocked by a night light or night fury. Buzzsaw then appears with the sky torture he'd kept nestled in his ass all season, and through the dumbest chain of events 
ever, Thunder opens Jormungandr's cage, and now he's loose. Meaning, if the kids had never bothered in the first fucking place, None of this would have ever happened. Oh, but Audrey, they didn't know that only a nightlight could open the gate. Fuck you. If you're going to apply basic human reasoning, then so am I. Buzzsaw never could have trained that damn sky torture, and the fact that it came out of nowhere, and Thunder has the bright idea to save Tom by opening the damn gate when he could have just attacked it? Come on. It is never explained why Buzzsaw's whistle works on the sky torture and not any of the other kids' dragons. Why does it work specifically on Jack and the sky torture? and nobody else. This is implying some sort of training which we never fucking see! Honestly, they fucking deserve Ragnarok at this point. Congratulations on yet another of my if the kids wanted to keep dragons safe, they should have just fucked off and left the dragons alone renditions. How many does that make now? I'm just pissed. But I'm also confused, mainly at the amount of people who genuinely hold this season is worse than all the others. Like, yeah, it's bad. But is it really any worse than the other horrible seasons so far? Yes, that includes the Tom and June episode, because at this point, their toxic relationship is just entertaining to me. Although, admittedly, I do kind of see what people mean. Usually every season, there's at least a Eugene or Alex-centric episode that saves it vaguely, but they even managed to fuck those up this time around. For me, it was the non- non-stop needless conflicts that really tore this season down. Not that there's ever been much good conflict in this show, but this time it was especially awful. I can only assume it's because the showrunners are nearing the end of the series and they were more rushed than ever while writing this time around. But come on, you have to have a little pride. Just because this is a show for children with short attention spans doesn't mean long-form conflicts can't be introduced and explored throughout several seasons. That way the buildup feels genuine or at the very least, earned. For God's sake, if the people running the show would put in as much effort into having the characters go through non-contrived conflicts as they do gaslighting us into thinking that June is wonderful and her and Tom don't have the most toxic romantic relationship in children's television history, can you imagine how great this show would be? But here we are. And I don't have much else to add. If I can say anything about season seven, out of all the seasons in the show so far, this one really speaks for itself. So I'll see you all in season eight, which at this point has already long since premiered. Thanks again for your patience. I needed the time to fully process this new edition so I did not unintentionally off myself. Oh, speaking of. <laughs> oh. Ugh. Holy shit. I want every single person who's out there that- Ugh. Who claims that June is not toxic. You look at me dead straight into my pupils, into my soul, and tell me otherwise. Anyway, let's end this video with me replying to comments from my last season review because that's a thing that I do. The show I can't fucking read. The showrunners attempting to have June be the Astrid stand-in is so laughable because you know that if Astrid had met Zoom- <laughs> Because you know that if she had met June, she'd immediately dislike her. <laughs> I mean, yes, that's true. But it also is not saying much. Because every fucking person dislikes June. You can't gaslight me, showrunners. I know better. Even drunk. That's pretty sad. As a victim of emotional abuse, June is just comically textbook toxicity. Even to the point where Tom feels obligated to help her through rough times. <laughs> what a time, vampire. First off, I'm sorry that that's something you had to experience. Second, this is the legitimate harm that I always talk about when it comes to portraying good characters as so unintentionally toxic. I know for damn sure the showrunners see everyone hating on June and they just like, oh, it's no big deal. They laugh it off. They know better than us viewers. They know they're making a great character, but they're doing so much more damage than I think they even can begin to realize. And for them to not only not acknowledge it, but also continue to make her worse as the seasons go on, is just insanity to me. And hell, look at me. I took a shot every time she was toxic. What does that say about her character? And my intelligence. Nothing good, obviously. The fact that June unquestionably 
question. All the fucking top liked comments are about June. The fact that June unquestionably and without a doubt checks all the boxes of one of the most well-known manipulation techniques just proves how awful the writers of this show are at writing likable characters. Except Alex, but she's great by mistake. Hey, don't forget Eugene, the king, the one and only. Cheers to him. My god, I am feeling this alcohol. Oh, shit. <laughs> this is pretty much what I was just saying. And I also really resent the fact that they turned Alex's introverted nature into a plot device this season. And anytime someone had something shitty to say about her, like when they were all criticizing each other, it was always about her sarcasm and introvertedness. It introvert- is that a word? It is now. When those are the things that make Alex so great and relatable to begin with, you think, you seriously think, she needs to be more like those other assholes? Fuck you. Don't do it. I will fight. Drunk or sober, I will do it. She is the queen and I will go down swinging. Eugene and Alex's characters are the definition of even a broken clock is right twice a day. That is... Such perfection. I'm gonna drink to you. And finally, considering season seven will feature the Dark Realm, which represents Helheim slash Hell as one of the nine realms in mythology, basic summary of next season, Tom and the gang go to hell. Preach, brother because you were right. The fact that they find literal hell in the same season that Tom and June get together is so poetically beautiful to me. But also, haven't we been here all along? Except now, it's canon. We love it. So that is gonna be all for this review. Thank you again for your patience. I can't wait to tackle the eighth and final season of this awful, awful show. Check out my Patreon for bonus content. In the meantime, I'm gonna need the extra money to get my stomach pumped. As always, please do not go after or harass any of the people who worked on this show or people who support it publicly. And everyone raise a glass for June's toxicity. I need to lay down. <laughs>